What if you need a coronavirus test and you don't have a car? We wanted to make sure that we did not have barriers that would prevent people from being able to get to our testing sites. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. The story of a walkable test site in New Hampshire and the communities it's reaching. And Maine has one of the lowest COVID-19 infection rates in the country, but it has the highest racial disparity. As a black man in rural Maine, I don't even always see the, the disproportionate impact on people of color because there might be five people in the district that I represent. Plus, a tattoo artist in Vermont is offering to cover up racist tattoos for free. You make a mistake, and unfortunately with tattoos, that mistake sticks with you. It's next. Next is produced at Connecticut Public Radio and is powered by the New England News Collaborative, 10 public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm Morgan Springer. Thanks for joining us. Like the country at large, New England states are taking a patchwork approach to reopening during the pandemic. Rhode Island just entered phase three on Tuesday, but most of the other states are still in phase two. This means people can now go inside a restaurant to eat, more stores are open, and in a lot of places, they can go to the gym. But don't be fooled. Reopening does not mean the pandemic is over. Our first guest is an infectious disease expert, and he's here to talk with us about steps we can take to try to avoid coronavirus during reopening. Keith Grant is Senior System Director of Infection Prevention at Hartford Healthcare Group in Connecticut. Keith, welcome to Next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. So as an infection disease expert, you recommended that people stay within a bubble. Briefly, can you just describe what that means? Absolutely. So by this bubble, my, what I mean is you have complete control of your environment, how you uh, sterilize your environment. So for example, in my household, I'm the person who is at highest risk to bring something in. So whenever I get into my household, there are certain practices I know I absolutely must do. And the minute I shift that and I get out of that household, um, I have less control over it. And uh, that's, that's exactly what I mean. So at least at the time of this interview right now, uh, infection rates and hospitalizations are dropping in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. And there was a slight increase in Maine and Vermont recently, but their cases are now dropping again, too. Uh, Does it make sense to you for people to feel more relaxed about social distancing at least a bit? I think, you know, an important piece of this is the fact that we are indeed social beings. There's so much benefits, uh, mentally especially. So do I believe that it's good for people to be out and socializing? I absolutely believe it's it's essential. It's very good. But doing so safely will ensure that um, we don't have an uptick per se from this decision. Okay, so question for you. Would you personally go to a gym or eat in a restaurant indoors right now? Uh, so eat in a restaurant, the states have advised the implementation of certain policies within the restaurant that should keep people separated and keep people safe. And so with that being said, I think if I go in a restaurant, I would be aware of your surrounding and ensure that these practices are in place, ensure that the tables are six feet apart at least. Would I go to a gym? Um, I'm uh, Gym is slightly more challenging for a number of reasons. Uh, it's very difficult to be masked and working out. And the increase in respiratory rate during workout, especially cardio, can actually increase the aerosolization of these particles. That within itself might be more challenging. The responsibility has to be on the patrons that are participating in the workout to ensure that they're putting practices in place to keep themselves safe. One of the things I've noticed lately is that the debate over wearing masks has heated up. Um, and some people are not wearing masks. How how do you convince a mask wearing skeptic that it's the right call? So two things: so mask wearing and hand hygiene. It's the two easiest process in this entire arsenal of what we can do to prevent the spread of the disease process. There's significant research to support this. Now, with the country that we're in and the rights that people enjoy in the U.S. 
people do have the right to say, you know, this is not something I want to do. And I, I, this is not something, even as far as it's not something I believe we should do. Uh, I don't agree with that. From an epidemiological and purely clinical perspective and out of the concern for the general population, whoever has that debate with me might have the same debate about seatbelts. And the research about seatbelts um, and how much life it saves and helmet when you're riding a motorcycle and how much life that saved as well. Uh, it's hard to debate that. Now, there, there's definitely a waiting period between reopening and knowing if we've done it safely, even though, as I've, I've mentioned, cases have been going down in, in most New England states. Do we know yet if reopening has been successful? And if not, when will we know? We have to look at what the aim of reopening was, right? So if the aim of reopening was to get people back together, socializing, and to put an ease on the increase in what we saw, uh, mental health conditions, and uh, psychotic uh, incidents, then I think it, it's been successful. But we have to keep in mind that the reason why we're having any form of discussion is the fact that there was a pandemic that at some point, even in our healthcare system, we had upward of over 400 positive patients. And uh, we've seen within the state of Connecticut over 4,000 deaths. That virus is still out there. So I think over the next month, we'll have an idea of over the phases. So has it been successful? I say partially it has been, and I'm talking about phase two. But phase one, I think it has been successful in multiple areas. It's increased the potential for people to socialize. And we haven't seen an increase in number from an epidemiological perspective. We've done a very collaborative, very unselfish approach up, up until this point. We just need to keep that momentum going. That was Keith Grant, a senior system director for infection prevention and an advanced practice registered nurse at Hartford Healthcare Group in Connecticut. Barber shops and hair salons were among the non essential businesses that closed during the COVID shutdowns. You probably noticed a lot more shaggy hairdos and big beards. But now the shops are open again in all New England states with new COVID regulations. And despite fears and uncertainty, clients are returning, ready for a trim. John Bender put together this audio portrait for the Publix Radio. Head west down Armistice Boulevard in Pawtucket, and eventually you'll hit Lanny's Barbershop. Tucked between stores and restaurants, the shop looks like something out of an old comic strip. It's got a hand-painted sign and one of those signature poles with the red and white stripes that spin. And on the first day of reopening, there was a line out the door. I just, I don't like long hair. Mine don't get long, it gets bushy. That's John. He's got curly gray hair that's thinning towards the top and an easy laugh. Yeah, a lot of guys were talking about, like, just shave it, just shave it. Like, nah, might not come back. <laughs> <laughs> Next to John is Paul. He's ahead of John in line. They're sitting on socially distanced chairs on the sidewalk. You're not allowed to wait inside anymore. Paul's been kicking himself for not getting a haircut back before all the shutdown started. Just when this coronavirus, when they closed everybody down, I was just ready to come in and get a haircut. I came by and they were, they were busy, so I said, I'll come back tomorrow. And tomorrow never came. <laughs> This is tomorrow. Yeah, this is tomorrow. <laughs> and this is driving me crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Though, honestly, Paul's hair is not that long. John points to his own head. I never get at this. This is terrible. I feel like I'm back in the 80s. <laughs> Both guys have been coming to Lanny's for decades. Oh, God, forever. Yeah, I remember when his dad was here, yeah. Was it Joe's No, brother? they were across the street in the first game. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. Lanny's was over there on that side. Yeah. And that was the original Lanny. I was only a kid. I was probably 17, going to him, you know, 16. Oh, yeah, that was great, but yeah. Great and, great. Uh, you know, of course, and back in those days, you know, there was my where I let my hair grow and get a little hippie-like. Inside, Joe and Alex are the two barbers, only two customers at a time, and everyone wears a mask. Didn't know how we were going to do it with all the new rules and uh, uh, all the cleaning and sterilization in between customers, uh, how the customers were going to act to it. But uh, so far, it's been pretty good. 
<laughs> Alex, the other barber, says the day's been nonstop, and that's a welcome yeah, change. Coming around the corner at, at 7, 6.45 this morning, you know, that really made you feel needed when you're, you know, you're like, man, people outside already, we don't open till 8, you know? Hey, man, you always need a haircut, and you always feel better after a haircut, in my opinion. Outside, John and Paul, still waiting to get in, are ready for their turns in the barber chair. You know, when, when you come here, I don't, they just kind of know. Yeah. Just sit in the seat, they know how you like it. They, they, they pretty much have to give them anything. Just, yeah. just say, hey, how you doing? And they stay go right to work. So. It's these relationships, the small, everyday ones we've lost during the pandemic, they say. Oh, it's everything you take for granted. You know, let's go grab a coffee, let's go to lunch, let's do this, let's do that. Every morning, go for a coffee over at, you know, the Honeydew Donuts, you know. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, now you go in, I get my coffee, but I go go sit in the car and, you know, eat my muffin or donut, whatever, you yeah. know. And then, you know, I read the paper, look at the traffic, you know. A few people show up once in a while, you talk through the car windows, you know, and that's about yeah. it, you know. Because normally you'd sit there, whoever showed up, you'd say, hey, you have the paper, you see the story, but you'd, you have a little conversation now. John drifts off. Any chance you get to talk to somebody, it's like, hey, it's a big day, you know. <laughs> it's true. It's tiring to go through all this. It just really is. Paul shrugs and gets ready to go in for his cut. One small ritual he's got back. That story was produced by John Bender for The Publix Radio. We're reopening. Some of us are broadening our social circles. And more coronavirus tests are being offered to anyone who wants one at places like CBS. It seems like the testing shortage concerns of the past few months are over. But they're not. Hospitals are having a hard time getting the crucial ingredients they need. And as WGBH Radio's Craig Lamalt reports, in some cases, that's preventing hospitals from providing important care. Matt Rabus stands at a laboratory hood at Holyoke Medical Center and records himself getting ready to run a COVID-19 test. Actually setting it up is pretty simple. He prepares a sample from a nasal swab and then squirts it into a specialized test cartridge that contains a liquid reagent made up of enzymes and other things that'll help determine if the RNA of the virus is present. So I'm transferring 300 microliters into the testing device and he loads the cartridge into a machine that does the test. All right, so now the test is running, and it will take about 36 minutes or so before we have our result. Actually doing the test is the relatively easy part. For Holyoke Medical Center and hospitals around the country, the challenge is getting their hands on those cartridges with the reagents. We're on a uh, very strict limitation of how many tests we can get per week. That's John Grombach, the lab director at Holyoke Medical Center. He says when they don't have enough tests in-house, they have to use an outside lab, and it can take two days to get those results, which is a problem because before anyone can be admitted to the hospital, they need to get tested, even psychiatric patients waiting in the emergency room. No patient wants to hang out in the ER for a day or two to wait for one test result, let alone someone with an altered mental status. And they test all patients before surgery. We've also had to cancel surgeries uh, two weeks ago when we had zero test kits. And you know these aren't these aren't surgeries. That, like, these aren't fun surgeries. When I say elective surgery, it gives you the false impression that like oh they don't need it, but a total knee replacement that's needed. Several other small hospitals in the state report having the same problem getting tests. And while large hospitals like MGH and Tufts Medical Center say they're facing the same challenge, Grombach says this kind of thing really hits community hospitals like his. We can't perform surgeries. We can't perform procedures. We can't service our community to have any kind of income. So this is drastically crippling us financially. And he doesn't understand why the outside labs can get test materials when hospital labs like his can't. Two of the companies that make the tests, Cepheid and Luminex, didn't make anyone available for this story. Michael Minna of the Harvard School of Public Health says he knows why outside lab companies are having an easier time getting tests than hospitals. The reason is we have a privatized health system. Minna says the companies are more interested in selling tests to what he calls mega labs, who have the ability to run a lot of them. They're going to prioritize the bigger contracts that they view as priority. 
um, over individual labs that might get less throughput, for example, on each test. And so there'll, there'll be smaller contracts overall. There's also a shortage of the materials needed to collect test samples, including swabs and the liquid the samples go into. But in Massachusetts, the state has a stockpile of those and has been able to help hospitals out. The state doesn't have any reagents, though. The shortages are an issue across the country. In a national survey by the American Association for Clinical Chemistry, half of the labs that responded said they were having trouble getting reagents or swabs. I think in short, we're not being very efficient or coordinated in how we're distributing the materials that are needed. Dr. Carmen Wiley is the president of the association, which represents clinical laboratories. She says this problem calls for some government oversight. That is one thing that AACC has been asking our federal government to do, is to coordinate the distribution of materials and supplies to the states and to the local hospitals and clinics, because we do need somebody to be organizing this effort. So far, the federal government has opted not to do that. In a written statement, a spokesperson for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services called out the company Cepheid by name, saying, quote, We recommend labs think about their workflows and optimize other instruments, using Cepheid only for those instances when a rapid result is imperative, unquote. At Holyoke Medical Center and other Massachusetts hospitals, they're doing just that, investing in testing systems from other companies. But they're running into shortages there, too. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Craig Lamoltz. Coming up, Maine has the worst racial disparity for COVID-19 infections in the country. We'll talk about why. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and the evolving clean energy economy. Support also comes from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York. Welcome back. I'm Morgan Springer. On Next, we've been following the story of how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected communities of color in the U.S. in terms of infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. New Hampshire Public Radio's Daniela Ali has this story on what the city of Nashua is doing to better reach these communities. Since early May, healthcare worker Lisa Vasquez was spending most of her Thursday afternoons in the parking lot of St. Aloysius of Gonzaga Church in Nashua. By 3 p.m., just before people arrived, Vasquez and the rest of the Nashua Public Health team donned gloves, gowns, and face shields as they got ready to test residents for COVID-19. All right, everybody stay safe. Let's have a good testing site today. Most of the testing sites in New Hampshire are drive-in, but this one in the church parking lot also had a separate line for people to just walk up and get a test. That is by design, Vasquez says. About one in four people in this neighborhood don't own a car. Uh, while you like drive around this community, you might see many people walking because it's um, a walkable community. People can walk to the downtown areas, to the library. Another thing you might notice, signs in a lot of different languages. Nashua is very culturally diverse in general, but in this area you see um, a lot of people that would maybe describe themselves as Latino, immigrants from Africa, Asia. Yeah. I can't think of any place that might not be represented. About 20% of people in this Nashua neighborhood are foreign-born. About 40% are Latino, according to the census. About a month into the pandemic, the city set up its first public testing site at a high school, but the school was only accessible to people with cars, which left out a large part of the Latino community the city was trying to reach. And so we were looking at social determinants of health, and we wanted to make sure that we did not have barriers that would prevent people from being able to get to our testing sites. That's Bobby Bagley, Nashua's public health director. She and other public health professionals say there are many factors that determine people's health outcomes, like where they live, how much they earn, and if they're a racial or ethnic minority in this country. Bagley and her team realized they needed a new testing site. And for a time, the St. Aloysius Church fit the bill. It's walkable, and it's known in Nashua as the Spanish Church. We wanted to make sure that we were, you know, reaching out to those communities that would be impacted the greatest by COVID-19, but were also uh, communities that usually 
are what we would call underserved. As Bagley's team was figuring out how to deal with COVID in their community, they were keenly aware of the nationwide statistics that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting Black and Latino people. In New Hampshire, those two groups make up about 17 percent of total COVID cases statewide, but account for just a little over 5 percent of the state's population. This isn't necessarily a surprise to Bagley. She says the disease is more likely to affect people with underlying health conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, and those already disproportionately affect minority communities. Bagley says a big priority for her office was reaching out to community leaders and organizations with information about prevention, social support systems, and locations to get tested for COVID. Si usted quiere... Part of that is getting the message out in different languages. Lisa Vasquez, one of the city's bilingual public health workers, does regular PSAs in Spanish on the radio. She also translates information into Spanish and spends time answering the city's COVID-19 hotline. Bobby Bagley says she feels Nashua's strategy so far has reached the area's Latino population in a meaningful way. Nearly 30 percent of people who have gotten tests so far at city clinics are Latino. But Bagley says there are still communities that haven't been as reached in her city. We don't have that same type of access or um, even reaching out to get tested from our refugee population in Nashua. Or people who are low income. And Bagley says she noticed fewer African-Americans or African residents were stopping by the testing center at St. Aloysius Church. Just recently, the city decided to move the testing site at the church parking lot to the public library a few blocks away. With the state reopening, church activities are starting up, and the parking lot won't be empty. Nashua's concern, though, goes beyond COVID-19. Bagley says other inequities affect health outcomes, economics, education, and systemic racism. And we know in particular with our populations of color, those disparities have existed for decades. And so we need to make sure that we have a particular focus on addressing those needs so that we can close those gaps and improve the the health outcomes for that population group. States across New England are acknowledging that structural inequities have made the COVID-19 crisis worse for communities of color. In New Hampshire, Governor Chris Sununu appointed Bagley to a five-person equity response team to develop a plan to address some of those disparities. But Bagley says that focus needs to be a sustained part of the state's response, not just to the current pandemic, but in normal times, too. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Daniela Alley. Maine has one of the lowest infection rates for COVID-19 in the U.S. And yet, the state has the worst racial disparity for coronavirus infections in the country. That's according to a recent analysis from the Associated Press. Just over 1% of Maine's population is Black. But state data show that Black residents make up about a quarter of the state's COVID cases. In neighboring New Hampshire and Vermont, also very white states, the disparity isn't as severe. Craig Hickman is the longest-serving Black legislator in Maine. He's also a farmer, businessman, and poet. Representative Hickman, welcome to Next. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. These racial inequities exist across the country, but the Portland Press-Herald reports that one out of every 27 Black residents in Maine have contracted the virus. For white residents, it's one out of 725 So why do you think Maine has the worst racial disparity when it comes to coronavirus cases? In many ways, strength in numbers would mean that there would be more people paying attention to these disparities from the beginning. When you have 1.5% of a population that is Black or African American and only 5.6% of the population overall that is people of color in general, you don't see the disparities. In fact, It wasn't until the end of April, I believe, that a group of leaders in the communities of color insisted that the Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC start actually tracking COVID cases by race and ethnicity because we drive the buses and we clean the hospital floors and we empty the nursing home bedpans. We take out the public's trash. We build the houses and fix the roads. We grow and process and prepare and deliver our community's food. And we serve on the front lines in healthcare. And so we knew that we were going to be disproportionately impacted by this virus. 
the head of the state's CDC, Dr. Nurav Shah, has said that the disproportionate infection rates are, quote, unacceptable to every single person who is working on the response, unquote. What has the state done to address this disparity, at least in the short term? Engaged in a lot of conversations. That's it. The state has engaged in a lot of conversations with communities that have been disproportionately affected. Yes, that's what it has done so far. Hmm. I'm guessing that you feel like they should do more. We are imploring them to declare racism a public health emergency. And so we are asking the state to take a holistic approach to making sure that if we're going to mitigate against this disparity, that we need a new approach that does not necessarily use the same tools that will not dismantle the master's house, that we need to build systems from the ground up and work in partnership with the communities who know best how to take care of themselves. So there's addressing systemic racism in the state. Then there's like also addressing the very immediate uh, needs of people of color who are being disproportionately infected I had read that maybe there was some push for hotel rooms for isolation, some outreach to immigrant communities and some more testing there. Is that your understanding of what's happened as well? I believe some of that has happened, except that it has been inadequate because it has been done without wraparound services. So if you make a hotel available for someone to isolate, but then they have no access, say, to a kitchen where they can cook food. They may sneak home to cook their food, eat it, and then sneak back to the hotel, which completely diminishes the whole point of isolation. We are calling upon the state to allocate a significant portion of the CARES Act funding to address systemic racism and the COVID disparities and all of the public health infrastructures that that negatively, disproportionately impact people of color in Maine. You've been a state representative for four terms. Are there steps that the Maine legislature could have taken during those years to address racial inequities before the pandemic? I think that's fair to say. The bills that I have supported, the pieces of public policy that I've supported would absolutely do a great deal to promote resilience in disaffected communities in Maine, not just communities of people of color, but poor rural communities where mills have closed and there are no jobs. And I do think that people have awakened to the realities that we have as people of color who have been activists in trying to improve our own lives forever. People now see just how toxic and destructive and quite frankly murderous has been systemic racism in this country. And so again, when you are the only person of color in a body that governs a state of people where the percentage of people of color is low, it is really difficult to draw attention specifically to the issues of the communities that you are a part of. And so as a Black man in the rural Maine, I don't even always see the the disproportionate impact on people of color because there might be five people in the district that I represent. But because I grew up in an urban segregated city, Milwaukee remains one of the most segregated cities in the United States of America. I certainly understand the negative impacts of systemic racism on wealth accumulation for people of color. Without wealth accumulation, you are constantly perpetually, chronically dependent on the state. And so you become a target of all sorts of racist nonsense. And so we really need a new system. So we do the best we can. And we know we need to do better. Craig Hickman is the longest serving Black legislator in Maine. Representative Hickman, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Last week, we asked you, our listeners, if you felt disadvantaged in the healthcare system because of your race or ethnicity. 
we heard from listener Diane Granier from Rocky Hill, Connecticut, who called to share her experience, not as a patient, but as a home care nurse who witnessed inequitable care. I had a female black patient in Hamden, Connecticut, and a male white patient in Guilford, Connecticut, both with the same exact diagnosis, same age group, same doctor, same insurance, everything was matching and the progression of their disease was matching. The male patient was offered artificial nutrition because he couldn't eat anymore. The female patient was not offered artificial nutrition, but she was asking for it. And I called the doctor several times requesting it for her. And he kept saying that she didn't need it. And so I finally said, is it because she's black? And he hesitated and he literally said, I don't know. It was so sad. As a white nurse in the field, that was quite eye-opening for me. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you to listener Diane Granier for sharing her story. This week, we want to know how the pandemic has impacted your personal relationships. Has it brought you closer to friends, family members, romantic partners, or farther apart? Leave a comment at 860-275-7595. Again, 860-275-7595. You can also email us at next at ctpublic.org. One more time, next at ctpublic.org. And thanks. For more than a decade, a tattoo artist in Vermont has been offering to remove racist tattoos for free, like swastikas or the white supremacist slogan, white power. But recently, as protests over police violence continue and his work has gotten more exposure, he's seen an uptick in clients taking him up on the offer. Alex Lawrence owns Mountainside Tattoo in Bellows Falls, Vermont, and he says he's creating a nonprofit called Erase Your Hate to promote the covering up of racist tattoos and to help people overcome past mistakes. I'm just trying to help people, uh, you know, erase that part of their past. You know, <clears throat> I've made plenty of mistakes myself over the years, and I've had people help me along the way, you know, help me recover, pick myself back up. Any tattoos that you regret? No. Well, yeah. Not my, my tattoos aren't regretful because of what they are. It's just the quality of them. So uh, since the protests began after the killing of George Floyd, how many requests have you gotten to cover up or remove tattoos? Since the exposure, my inbox is overflowing. Uh, before that, I had gotten a few, but mostly... Most of the ones I was doing weren't really racial. They were like job stoppers, you know? Like what? Um, like facial tattoos. Because, I, I mean, I do all right. I live comfortably. You know, I, I, I started my business back in August of 2006 here in Vermont. <clears throat> I had just gotten sober like 19 years ago, and I had nothing to my name. I was driving junky cars. Now I own <clears throat> two of the buildings in the square. You know, I just took my money that I was making as I was tattooing and reinvested into my business. And I'm only here today because of the people that have helped me along the way when I got sober. You know, those were my mistakes. My mistakes were drug related. I had a nightmarish childhood. I medicated because um, I didn't know how to deal with it. You know, I, I got into cocaine. I ended up smoking it. I've got some great mug shots hanging on my wall that are a daily reminder from folio from growing up where I was like maybe 115 pounds soaking wet. I looked like a drowned river rat. You know, I was in rough shape, you know. It seems like a maybe a grounding philosophy for you, and correct me if I'm wrong, is like we are not our past mistakes. That's exactly my philosophy. And that's the problem. People tend to want to keep you in that, that boat, you know. I mean, I, I still get judged. <laughs> Even today, I still get judged. You know, I walk into a store, I'm covered with tattoos. You know, I, I see the eyes, I see the judgments. So in terms of, let's talk about the people who come in with racist or hateful tattoos and ask you to remove them. What's, give me one example of an explanation that a client gave for wanting to remove their tattoo. He was young, stupid, foolish, and he's like, yeah, let's do it, you know. It was a huge swastika on the inside of his bicep with a skull. Um, 
And I just covered it up. I turned the skull into a reaper and hid the swastika part of it with uh, the reaper's cowl. And of course, he, the tattoo he got was homemade, crappily done, which I find that most of the racist tattoos that I'm covering, they're not professionally done. They're not, they're not well done tattoos. They're just horrible. It, it offends me as an artist. <laughs> I've got another guy coming in next week that has white power, white going down one calf from the back of his knee down to his ankle and power on his other calf going from the back of the knee down to his ankle. Did he give you a reason for wanting to get it removed? I haven't, I haven't done his session yet, but I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be talking to him when he comes in. It seems like um, this is obviously a big commitment for you. I mean, you're not only offering this for free, um, but it's also a big process, whether you're covering it up or removing it. When you're done, what's the feeling for you? Like, what do you get out of it? Um, just feels good. Like when I was, uh, you know, years ago when I was using, I, I caused a lot of destruction. I hurt a lot of people. You know, I used a lot of people, you know, and, I, and it felt, shit, you know, which is probably one of the reasons why I stayed getting high and stayed messing up. I want to be known for something good when I leave. I want to be known as the guy that gave back. That was Alex Lawrence, the owner of Mountainside Tattoo in Bellows Falls, Vermont. He also tattoos at Sacred Body Tattoo in Enfield, Connecticut. Alex says he hopes other tattoo artists around the country will participate in Erase Your Hate. That's the nonprofit he's creating. He says people have already contacted him who want to join. After the break, Ben & Jerry's ice cream company has been praised for its statement in support of protesters. But local activists are pushing back on that, saying Ben & Jerry's needs to do more. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate and clean energy. After the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and protests calling for racial justice, companies around the world put out statements intended to show support for racial equity. Many of those messages were criticized as being vague, though one Vermont company has earned praise for its response, Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream. The company has a long history of speaking out on social justice and left-leaning political issues. But as Vermont Public Radio's Henry App reports, some local activists see the company as falling short on its rhetoric. Just days after George Floyd was killed, Ben & Jerry's published a blog post titled, We Must Dismantle White Supremacy. That caught the attention of a lot of social media users who were impressed by the company's language and its record. Did you know that apparently Ben & Jerry's ice cream is so expensive because they hire people recently released from the prison system and pay them $16 or more an hour? That's a video posted by TikTok user Della West. They doing the damn thing. Ben & Jerry's has been a darling of social justice activists long before its recent statements. The South Burlington Company says it pays its Vermont employees a minimum of just over $18 an hour. And they stopped doing criminal background checks in 2015. We should disclose here that Ben & Jerry's is a VPR underwriter. The company also has a long track record of speaking out on issues from climate change to refugee resettlement to transgender rights. And Ben & Jerry's CEO Matthew McCarthy says speaking out on racial justice is nothing new for the company. Back in 2016, we went on record in support of Black Lives Matter. And in 2019, the company endorsed a bill in Congress which would study the effects of systemic racism. Endorsing that specific legislation was critical, McCarthy says. What I have learned uh, as a white male of privilege, spending a lot of my life not even understanding the very concepts of white privilege and the benefits that I've received through my entire life as a, as a white man, um, that systemic racism is everywhere. It is literally everywhere. And understanding it is a prerequisite for dismantling it. 
So after the killing of George Floyd, Ben & Jerry's reiterated its support for those measures. Then on Juneteenth, the company put out a statement echoing calls by protesters to defund police departments in favor of public investments in things like affordable housing and mental health care. Paul Argenti, who studies corporate communication at Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business, says statements like these make business sense for Ben & Jerry's. They're coming to understand that taking a political or a social stand is really a way to stay relevant, particularly with millennials. Argenti gives the company credit for being more specific and pointed than some other companies, but he doesn't think it means much. You know, I mean, they're not in a position to really change the nature of the conversation. So what would really make a splash? Curtis Reed Jr., who directs the Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity, says Ben and Jerry's should do something that would affect their bottom line. Specifically, he thinks they should name a flavor after a prominent activist of color. When you begin naming your product after Muhammad Ali or Colin Kaepernick, maybe you'll see a slip in your bottom line. And so I believe that they should put themselves out if they want to embrace action around racial injustice, then let's not name ice creams after non-controversial white guys. Those non-controversial white guys, Jerry Garcia, Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon, the members of the band Fish, they do make up most of Ben & Jerry's tribute flavors. Last year, the company issued a limited-run flavor called Justice Remixed. Some of the proceeds go to a racial justice organization. But Curtis Reed wasn't impressed. How many decades have they had Jerry Garcia? How many years have they had Jimmy Fallon? You know, how many years have they had Fish? A Ben & Jerry's spokesperson says in a statement that the company, quote, appreciates the energy around this idea, but notes that the company does not want to be viewed as, quote, trying to profit off the movement. Ben & Jerry's profits aren't public because the brand is owned by Unilever. That conglomerate reported over $6 billion in net profits in 2019. Beyond racial justice issues, Ben & Jerry's gets mixed reviews from activists. The group Migrant Justice targeted the company in 2015, aiming to get Ben & Jerry's to improve working conditions for migrant workers on Vermont's dairy farms. Ben & Jerry's signed on in 2017, but... It took years of convincing. That's Marita Canedo, who coordinates Migrant Justice's Milk with Dignity program. It takes time for people to understand uh, and for companies to understand how much power they have and how much control of um, dynamics of power in, in small places like a farm. They can really change just by understanding and listening to the voices of the most vulnerable communities. So the company came around to work with Migrant Justice. But there's one issue that activists in Vermont have pushed the ice cream company on for years to no avail. Wafik Faur with Vermonters for Justice in Palestine says his organization has been campaigning for seven years around Ben and Jerry's operations in Israel, where the company has done business since 1987. We asked Ben and Jerry to pull out its business from... uh, Palestinian occupied land and illegally built Jewish only settlements in the West Bank. Faur says given the company's activism around issues of racial justice, their lack of action on the plight of Palestinians is hypocritical. For its part, Ben and Jerry's says it's committed to its licensee in Israel, while also, quote, continuing to be a voice for positive change. The company also notes that its Israeli manufacturing facility and two scoop shops are located outside of occupied territories. Still, in recent weeks, activists on social media have taken notice of Ben & Jerry's Israeli operations. Now, many of those glowing reviews, like the one that we heard at the beginning of this story, have spawned responses like this video from TikTok user Fatidi. As much as everyone is praising Ben & Jerry's for their activism and speaking out about the Black Lives Matter movement and racism in America... We need to address the fact that Ben & Jerry's is pro-Israel and actively Zionist. Fatidi is calling on people to boycott the company. That video has over 120,000 views. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Henry App. We 
leave you today with the sound of activists gathering at a rally in Concord, New Hampshire, protesting against systemic racism and the killing of black Americans by police officers. The rally came as Black Lives Matter supporters in the state released a list of demands aimed at candidates for governor. Among those demands are an end to the use of tear gas and rubber bullets on unarmed protesters and the creation of the Civilian Oversight Board for law enforcement. New Hampshire Public Radio's Todd Bookman attended the rally and has this audio postcard. I saw somebody out there holding up a sign that says live free or die, New Hampshire's motto. And I don't know about you guys, but I intend to live by that motto, live free or die. So we're here at the State House, right? This is where change happens. The power has been given back to the people because this is an election year. This is an election year, which means that your vote matters. Black lives matter. Your vote matters. I was born by the river in a little town. Oh, just like the river I've been running ever since. You know, I had nobody to look up to. I had nobody that looked like me as a teacher, as an educator, as a politician, as a doctor, as a nurse. So those are things we need to be. Those are things we need to do. We need to show our youth what we can be. It's been too hard a living, but I'm afraid to die. And I'm not going to lie. I am tired. I am frustrated. I am sad. I am angry. I have times when I'm hopeful and optimistic. But now is the time for change. Let's stop talking and let's start taking action. Recently, Governor Sununu stated that there are elements of racism and bias, but no systematic racism in law enforcement in New Hampshire. If the only way that the governor and others like him can see racism is as individual, isolated, cases disconnected from broader, ongoing patterns of historical oppression, then y'all don't understand racism and y'all need to learn. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent or a Libertarian or a member of another political party. You will be held accountable. Black children deserve a first day of high school to graduate college, buy a house, Start a family. Don't I deserve to see my 18th birthday? Mother, mother. There's too many of you crying. Brother, brother. There's far too many of you dying. I am dead on the inside. I can't breathe, no breath can I take. Will I be forever degraded? Is my skin God's mistake? I can't breathe. Knocking me back down on my do with your voice? What are you going to do with your vote? Black lives matter! A long time coming, but I know a change going to come. Oh, yes it will. Thank you. Those were the voices from a Black Lives Matter rally in Concord, New Hampshire. 
We heard from Joe Kelly, Joseph Lascaz, Najee Brown, Jackie Gadson, Grace Kendeke, Jordan Thompson, Renell Chella, Samuel Alisea, and David Tamani. 14-year-old Zeke of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was singing. And that's our show this week. You can find Next wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Next New England. Next is produced by me, Morgan Springer. Vanessa De La Torre is our executive editor. The executive producer is Katie Tolarski. Daniela Luna is our intern. The New England News Collaborative is powered by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Connecticut Public Radio, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, New England Public Radio, WBUR, WCAI, WGBH, WSHU, and the Public's Radio. 